Jesus Christ made seven statements while he was on the cross. They are recorded in the Gospels between the time of his crucifixion and his death. These phrases are held dear by the followers of Christ. As much as possible, based on the approximate sequence of events portrayed in the Gospels, I will present the seven last words of Jesus in chronological order and will meditate on these statements. The first statement is noted in Luke 23:34. Father, I forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Let us meditate Jesus of Nazareth looking down from the cross just after he was crucified between two criminals. He sees the soldiers who have mocked, scourged and tortured him and who have just nailed him to the cross. He probably remembers those who have sentenced him. Caiaphas and the high priest and the Sanhedrin. Pilate realized it was out of envy that they handed him over. But I think this is also thinking of his apostles and companions who have deserted him. Peter who has denied him three times. The fickle crowd who only days before praised him on his entrance to Jerusalem and then days later demanded his crucifixion. I think the list is not complete. He might have been thinking of us also, who deny him every day. Similarly, at the height of his physical suffering, his love prevails over suffering and he asks his father to forgive. Right up to his final hours on earth, Jesus preaches forgiveness. He teaches forgiveness in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. When asked by Peter how many times should we forgive someone, Jesus answered 70 times 7, which I think was Jesus' special way of hinting infinity rather than for 90. He forgives the paralytic at Capernaum, the sinful woman who anointed him in the home of Simon the Pharisee, and the adulterous caught in that and about to be stoned. The list is endless. During the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper, Jesus tells them to drink of the cup. Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And even following his resurrection, his first act is to commission his disciples to forgive. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Dear all, let us look into our minds, very deep into our minds. Are we really forgiving? How do we behave to those who might have hurt us? Remember that our Lord, while He was hurt most, prayed for forgiveness. Can we follow this example? Please remember that He has no thought for Himself only for others. He has nothing left now to give away. Even his clothes have been taken away from him. But he is still able to give people his love. He is still able to give people his forgiveness. The cross is the epitome of his self-giving. The second saying on the cross is found in Luke 23.43. Truly, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. It is not just the religious leaders or the soldiers that mock Jesus. Even one of the criminals who was crucified together with Jesus mocked him. But the criminal on the right speaks up for Jesus, explaining that two criminals are receiving their just due. Whereas this man has done nothing wrong. Then turning to Jesus, he asked, Jesus, Remember me when you come in your kingdom. What a wonderful faith this repentant sinner has in Jesus. He is acknowledging Jesus while Jesus was the most vulnerable, while Jesus was alone and deserted by his disciples, ignoring his own suffering. Jesus responds with mercy in his second saying, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The second saying again is about forgiveness, though it is directed to a sinner at this time. Just as the first saying, 
This saying is found only in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus shows his divinity by opening heaven for a repentant sinner. What a generosity to a man that only asks to be remembered. Jesus doesn't reproach the criminal for repenting only at the eleventh hour. He doesn't cast doubt on the genuineness of his repentance. Jesus simply gives his penitent believer the assurance he longs for. Jesus promises him not only entry to the paradise involving the joy of the Christ's presence, but an immediate entry that very day. This expression offers us hope for salvation, for if we turn our hearts and prayers to him and accept his forgiveness, we will also be with Jesus Christ at the end of our lives. We read the third saying in John 19:26-27. Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then he said to the disciple, This is your mother. Jesus and Mary are together again. We see them together in John's Gospel at the beginning of his ministry in Cana and now at the end of his public ministry at the foot of the cross. John is the only evangelist to record our Lord's mother Mary at the cross. The Lord refers to his mother as woman at the wedding feast of Cana and in this passage. Recalling the woman in Genesis 3.15, the first messianic prophecy of the Redeemer. What sorrow must fill Mary's soul, how she must have felt meeting her son as he carried the cross to Calvary. And then she had to watch him being nailed to the cross. Once again, a sword pierces Mary's heart. We are reminded of the prophecy of Simeon at the presentation of the infant Jesus in the temple. The loved ones of Jesus are with him in John's Gospel. There are four at the foot of the cross, Mary his mother, John the disciple whom he loved most, his mother's sister Mary the wife of Clophas, and Mary Magdalene. He addresses his third word to his mother Mary and John, the only eyewitness of the Gospel writers. Jesus again rises above the question as he cares for the ones that he loves him, a good son that he is. Jesus is concerned about looking after his mother. St. Joseph was noticeably absent. St. Joseph was not present at family occasions like the wedding feast of Cana and had probably died before the public ministry of Jesus. Or else he would have been the one to take care of Mary following the passion of our Lord. In fact, this passage indicates that Jesus was the only child of Mary because if he had natural brothers and sisters, they would have provided for Mary, but Jesus looks to John to take care of Mary. The fourth saying is recorded in Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34. It reads, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was the only expression of Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Both Gospels related that to us in the ninth hour, after three hours of darkness, that he cried out this fourth saying. The ninth hour was three o'clock in Judea. Jesus of Nazareth fulfills the messianic prophecy of the suffering servant of the Lord. After the fourth word, Mark related with a horrible sense of finality, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. The fifth saying of Jesus is recorded in John 19.28. It is read as, I thirst. The Gospel of John first refers to thirst when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well. After first asking for a drink, he answers the woman, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I, give, I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. This passage implies there is more than just physical thirst. Jesus also thirsts in a spiritual sense. Jesus thirsts on the cross that we may never thirst again. Let us hear the voice of Jesus saying, Behold, I freely give the living water 
the Stephen stooped down and drink and leave. Let us go to Jesus and drink of the life giving stream. Let our thirst be quenched. Let our soul be revived. And let us live in Him. The sixth saying we read in John's Gospel 1930. When Jesus had received the sour wine mingled with gold, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and hunted over the Spirit. The Gospel of John recalls the sacrifice of the Passover lamb in Exodus 12 in this passage. The soldiers offered sour wine mingled with gold to drink on a spring of his soap to the Lord. His soap is a small plant that was used to sprinkle the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorposts of the Hebrews. John's Gospel related that it was the day of preparation, the day before the actual Sabbath Passover, that Jesus was sentenced to death and sacrificed on the cross. John continues in 1933-34, But when they came to Jesus and saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Recalling the instruction in Exodus 12.46 concerning the Passover lamb, he died at the ninth hour, that is three o'clock in the afternoon, about the same time as the Passover lambs were slaughtered in the temple. Christ became the Paschal or Passover lamb, as noted by St. Paul, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. The innocent lamb was slain for our sins so that we might be forgiven. The sixth word is Jesus' recognition that his suffering is over and his task is completed. Jesus is obedient to the Father and gives his love for mankind by redeeming us with his death on the cross. Perhaps these are the most momentous words he ever spoken in the history of the world. Already in anticipation, Jesus claimed that he has completed the work he came into the world to do. Now he makes a public declaration of it. But his cry is not the despairing groan of the one who is dying in resignation and defeat. It is a shout uttered in a loud voice, proclaiming a resounding victory. Christ has made what the letter to the Hebrews calls one single sacrifice for sins. And to demonstrate the dramatic nature of what Christ has done, the veil of the temple is torn down from top to bottom. The curtain has sunk for centuries between the outer and the inner sanctuaries as an emblem of the inaccessibility of God to sinners. For no one might penetrate beyond the veil into the presence of God except the high priest on the day of atonement. But now, the veil is torn in half and discarded. It is needed no longer. The worshippers in the temple courts gathered that afternoon for the evening sacrifice are dramatically informed of another and a better sacrifice by which they can draw near to God. Luke records the seventh word. Jesus cries out in loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The seventh word is directed to the Father in heaven just before he dies. Jesus recalls Psalm 31 5, Into thy hands I commend my spirit, thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Luke repeatedly pleads Jesus' presence, innocence, and immediately after his death with the centurion. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised to God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. By word and deed, Jesus indicates that his death is his own voluntary act. Jesus could have escaped death right up to the last minute. As he said in the garden of Gethsemane, he could have summoned more than 12 legions of angels to rescue him. He could have come down from the cross as his mockers challenged him to do. But he didn't. Of his own free will and deliberate choice, he gives himself up to death. The last two sayings from the cross proclaim Jesus the conqueror of sin and death. Let us come humbly to the cross 
deserving nothing but judgment pleading nothing but mercy let us pray together with the blind man jesus son of david have mercy upon us let christ deliver us from both the guilt of sin and the fear of death